It is a lovely night in our fabulous hills, and I'm glad to be with you. I've been, um, I went to school for so many years, it's embarrassing, and I've been thinking about the world a lot lately, and among my conclusions is that there are two fundamental type of people in the world, as you all know, those who are not Kathleen Flake, and those who are Kathleen Flake. <laughs> and I'm only partly joking. Uh, she enjoys a prominent reputation in this country as a scholar that is normally achieved in the academy in one of three ways. And the first is among the scientists and social scientists um, through the article or a series of articles that make a difference um, in the world of knowledge, sometimes signed by two authors in that realm, or three or five or eight. They're very collaborative, those social scientists and scientists. In, the, in fields like history or religious studies, the trade in uh, the tool of the trade is fundamentally the book where sustained um, knowledge and exploration of change across time um, is the sort of thing that would um, need to be accomplished, for instance, to be tenured in most universities. <coughs> the third way that this is achieved, again, is to be Kathleen Flake. <laughs> and what I mean by that is this woman had a reputation before she wrote much of anything. I had heard about her not through her writing, but through her Kathleen Flakiness. <laughs> um, she, by being herself and impacting people directly, uh, one knows one has had an encounter. And um, that, Kathleen, in my case, and I think in some others, uh, recommended you to me before I had either met you or read you. She has, since that time, of course, written, thank goodness. And while doing so, she has, among other things, become our chief theorist in Mormon studies. Richard Bushman once paid that compliment to Jan Ships because her um, crucially important book, um, Mormonism, The Story of a New Religious Tradition, was um, though Jan herself never took a religious studies class in all of her training and graduate school training, <clears throat> she had to learn how to think about how religion works by taking on Mormonism, writing about the history of Mormonism, but then being the most trusted voice or among the several most trusted voices in dealing with the media whenever Mormonism was seen by the media as an object worthy of study. She had to learn a new language that does not come by second nature to academics, by the way, and that is media speak. Uh, and and uh, the book she produced eventually is informed by that sort of theory and how do I make how religion works um, to others to, to whom it is not native or a tradition like Mormonism that is foreign to so many people. I think it may be the case that Kathleen is her natural heir in theory um, mixed with history or historically informed theory or theoretically informed history that is as a um, in caliber something resembling Jan's work. She has also created the most compelling account we have of the logic of plural marriage, the emotional and priestly logic of plural marriage, which is of uh, some considerable interest both to uh, members of the LDS Church and their external observers. She has rewritten our understanding of the great accommodation that was um, negotiated, and she does insist um, on its negotiated character uh, between the Latter-day Saints and the federal government between 1890 and 1910 or so. And in the process of rewriting our understanding, 
she has shown Mormonism to be the prime case, perhaps, in creating the nation's fundamental boundaries concerning limits of religious freedom and tolerance for the emergent 20th century. She sold out, Kathleen, you sold out, and I'm still trying to be generous towards you. She sold out in titling her book, The Politics of American Religious Identity. Sold out to accuracy, that is, and to academic um, trenchant parlance. But um, I'm far more fond of the title that was affixed to her work when it was in dissertation form. Mr. Smoot goes to Washington. <laughs> she has pursued such realms as these, not in the interest of studying Mormonism merely for its own sake, but as a way to uh, address wider questions about how religion functions using Mormonism as a prime case study. And that has resulted in distinctive interest of outside scholars of American religion and of religion as such. Uh, and she's going to talk to us um, today. Her title suggests learning by study, even religious studies. I dare say we can anticipate commentary on the importance of that approach. I have a lot of students that come my way, given my profession, usually up in Logan, Utah, who um, want to study student, undergraduate students and graduate students who want to come and study Mormonism. Many of them, not all, and increasingly not all, many of them are LDS themselves, and they're fascinated, uh, intellectually hungry, and uh, sometimes um, spiritually hungry. So we have to talk a good bit, counsel a good bit over um, semesters and years about how to go about that. And one of the things I try to get across to them is, you. You can't major in religious studies. Uh, the best scholars of Mormonism, I'll just leave, uh, there's a number of names here, even in this room today that I could cite, but in an earlier generation who helped make the study of the Latter-day Saints a plausible and respected enterprise on a national and international stage. So I'm thinking of people like Jan Ships or Leonard Arrington or Richard Bushman. Um, these scholars have all done other things, even been trained in other things, and brought those eyes to bear on the study of the Latter-day Saints, and thereby been able to do people who were um, to do more than people who were just too narrowly focused on the Latter-day Saints themselves. Kathleen is among these. Among the things that she's done earlier in her life that she's brought to bear in her consciousness as um, evident by her writings and sometimes by her speech is that she was back in the 1970s very active in causes of justice, especially pioneering as a young activist in issues of women's rights during the 1970s on crucial matters with which American society and the church still struggle under making important strides in, but the issues are alive and well. She was an attorney in Washington, D.C., supervising many other attorneys, and she reported to now Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in addressing the nation's savings and loans mess that was a precursor to our recent unhappy. <coughs> financial meltdown in the nation. While attending to that job, she attained a master's degree in the study of uh, theology and particularly in the study of ritual at Catholic Young University. Not many Latter-day Saints, if, if any, um, preceded her in that enterprise. And bringing the background and maturity to her advanced studies, the background um, as suggested by those several elements I just mentioned, she left her legal career, which takes a little bit of hoots paw and self-confidence, uh, left her um, legal studies to end her doctoral studies at the University of Chicago in American Religious History. And I have had um, 
more than one professor at that institution, including the particularly well-known Martin Marty. Martin Marty was, even at the popular level by surveys, the second most recognized religious figure in the nation for some years after Billy Graham. So if that doesn't happen to scholars very often. Uh, Martin Marty once said within my hearing, uh, while Kathleen was in the first year or two of her studies at Chicago, well, she's more like a colleague than a student. Um, so when I was in my graduate program, they said, he's more like a mascot than a real student. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen's intellectual passion is then are in theology, ritual, religious studies, history, the law, and of course, religion. Drawing on these interests and backgrounds, she illuminates most anything she affixes her gaze to. It required expertise in all of those fields to produce a book like The Politics of American Religious Identity. I suggest we all listen carefully for such dimensions informing her reflections to us. No scholar, finally, who encounters Dr. Flake misses the impression that, whoosh, that was an experience. <laughs> that is, uh, her intellect is uncommon and she has such a formidable um, presence. And I gotta say, she loves a good intellectual fight. So again, I repeat, no scholar in the nation who encounters Dr. Flake does so without, hmm, I have just experienced something strong and illuminating. But because of that formidability, and Kathleen will, I hope, forgive me eventually, she's among the least overtly sentimental of my friends. Uh, but by my gauge, what quickens all this uncommon talent, all this brain power, is her complementary pastoral role that isn't always uh, evident in public when she drops all of our jaws with her um, brain power. And um, I do, I have had over the years a number of people who have been in one or another of her wards, so I know things about Kathleen that she is unaware that I know. And they go in the direction of, she has a deep and pronounced pastoral side to her. Uh, she is loving and nourishing and very attentive to those before her in her ward. And um, she has, for instance, spent a good many nights helping um, unprivileged, underprivileged um, folks with very basic skills how to get a driver's license, how to make one's way in the midst of our complicated society for a certain percentage of our population. So, we are in for a treat tonight. I think it's time for a prayer, is it not? <laughs> Thank you, Phil, for that generous introduction. I, the, um, to tell you how highly I think of, of Phil, he has the last word in my class. I always teach his article, To Mend a Fractured World, about Joe Smith. When I teach my survey course on Mormonism, I recommend it to you. He has a fine mind and a sensitive take on Mormonism, so thank you for that, that introduction. I'm truly flattered. Let me also thank the Maxwell Institute and the Maxwell family for this introduction. It is a not only an extraordinary uh, tradition that is being maintained here in the name of Elder Maxwell and his spirit, but also one that is continuing to be built and grow in a manner that I think that pleases him very much. And it's an honor to me to be a part of that. So thank you. And I also thank all of you for coming. I, uh, you have my title. And it is true, as Phil says, I do want to talk about religious studies tonight. I, as you heard, I'm on a religious studies faculty. My position is dedicated to including Mormonism among a variety of religions researched and taught at the University of Virginia. 
Let me at the onset admit that I know that you have little reason to know what that means. When people learn that I'm a religious studies professor, they often start asking me questions about the Bible. Or, and the fact that you don't laugh shows that I'm right. Nobody really knows <laughs> what I do. Uh, or conversely, they are shocked to discover that I am personally religious and even of all things a practicing Mormon. I do not hold this against them. Even I did not understand this thing called religious studies when, as a joke goes, I became one. Uh, almost 25 years ago, I undertook to do it. I was working, as you heard, as an attorney in Washington, D.C., and had decided to pursue a long-standing interest in religion, which, of course, had been sparked by my own religion, but in some fashion I couldn't articulate, I was no longer satisfied by my existing methods. Uh, maybe I had needed to understand more about other religion in order to understand my own. Whatever the case, I decided it cost no more than what most lawyers spend to entertain themselves for me to go back to graduate school. So I decided to go. I, through a, a dear friend who's here tonight, I received an introduction to a member who was a, a person who was on the faculty, not a member, a, uh, a member of a faculty at Catholic University, and I went down just to speak with him for a minute to get a sense of what the options were to study religion. And he quickly ushered me down the hall to meet Sister Mary Collins. Now, I had never met a nun, and I just thought the cartoons were jokes, but they're not. <laughs> and she looked at me as if I were a bug on her windshield, and I was used to being looked at as an assistant general counsel. So there was a funny moment there when I realized if I did this, uh, my world would change dramatically. But she was impatient, and she wanted to know why I wanted to do this. I wasn't prepared for, it, for that question, but in the moment, an answer, um, as if I were speaking in tongues, sprung from my mouth. I said, well, I'm interested in how people experience the divine, but I'm more interested in how they articulate that. How do they manage to convey that experience? But most of all, I'm interested in how they convey it in a manner that can be duplicated by others. And then she started pushing admissions papers at me, and I, and, and I said, well, I haven't taken the GRE. I thought I had a little time to make this decision. She said, oh, that's fine. Take the Miller's Analogies test. And, uh, and, and I think it must have been 40 days later, I was sitting in a room with, surrounded by nuns and monks and other professionals studying 2,000 years of Catholic liturgy. And I felt, um, that I was at a candy store. It was, it was, it was wonderful. Um, but in that moment, when I said those three things, uh, I felt as if I were hearing them for the first time. It felt true, but I didn't know why. I only knew that it was right enough to cause this formerly reluctant, wonderful Sister Mary Collins to admit me to the program. I, uh, I realized then it took me a while to study. I realized then that my spontaneous list of three questions neatly recapitulated key elements of religious studies as a field in the academy. Specifically, my questions concern the human, not the heavenly condition of things. What does religion do, and how does it do it? Not which church is true. And that is about as good a definition as there is of what my interests continue to be. But before I say more about that, let me back up and give you a sense of what I want to talk about tonight. My title comes, as you no doubt recognize, from the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, and its revelatory assertion that the upbuilding of Zion would require the saints to seek out of the best books words of wisdom, and further admonish them to seek learning, even by study, and also by faith. In other words, the faithful were commanded to value and obtain secular as well as spiritual knowledge. In many ways, this is self-evident. Medicine is the most obvious example. In the West, at least, the majority of people, you know, religious people, believe in healing by science and also by faith. It is no less true that law, business administration, communications, and many other forms of worldly wisdom have always been a benefit to religious endeavors. I hope to convince you tonight that the faithful can likewise derive benefit from the best books and words of wisdom found in religious studies. 
Why is it necessary to make this case, a case that other professionals, even historians and musicians and English teachers, do not have to make? It is, no, it is in no small part because Christians have come to oppose reason to faith and place the study of religion in separate programs. Both are academic, both highly credentialed, but with different ends in mind. They seek to do something different. One system is concerned with the virtue and the veracity of a particular religion. Its professionals are grouped under the label religious education and found in denominationally sponsored institutions, including colleges and divinity schools. Does that sound familiar? This is illustrated, for example, by BYU's placing the study of religion in a religious education department. Their website explains, it is anticipated that students will leave BYU as built up in their faith and commitment to the Lord and his kingdom as they are prepared to engage the world through training in their chosen field. As a graduate of BYU, I value both sides of my training. In fact, when I had to come to BYU, because other options were not available through other circumstances out of my control, when I got there, I thought, well, at least I'll be able to study Mormonism. So I used to take two religion classes a semester and made a beeline for Deseret Book to get the Joseph Smith translation. And uh, that compensated a lot. So, in contrast, where I teach now, the University of Religion, the UVA Religious Studies Department, describes itself as, quote, rooted in the humanities and liberal arts, offering a comprehensive curriculum that spans traditions, geographies, and methodologies. We aim to advance a conversation that considers in a nuanced and open-minded way the complex reality of religion and religions. As you can see from these examples, religious studies, in contrast to religious education and religious education departments, is comparative and anthropological in the broad sense of the word. It compares and contrasts religious ideas and practices to identify patterns and anomalies that illuminate and thereby help us better understand the nature of religion itself and religious movements. Thus, like all humanities and social sciences, religious studies seeks to understand the human condition, not the truth of any given belief system. Religious studies scholars cannot tell you which church is true. This can make us a great disappointment to many, but that does not mean our ways of looking at religion have nothing to offer the faithful, as some have suggested. Let me give a quick example. At a time when the various Mormon studies positions were being created in religious studies departments, one religious educator editorialized, would a graduate student who has spent 45 hours in a semester-long course on Mormonism really have the hubris, which is a big word for pride, to think that he would have anything worthwhile to tell the typical church member who spends at least 150 hours a year in church meetings alone? to say nothing of the countless hours outside the Sunday block. Of course, I heard the challenge in that, but consistent with my religious studies training, I was more interested in what his question might offer as insight into what exactly do Latter-day Saints learn in 150 hours of attending church? <laughs> I remembered sitting in a church and hearing um, obviously a relatively new member of the church from another culture, explained that Joseph Smith had gotten on his horse and ridden up to heaven and got the Book of Mormon. And as interesting as that is, is the reaction of the congregation that just said, Amen, when he was done. <laughs> and I, and um, that experience has stayed with me. A friend just this week told me a, a wonderful story about from a music professor, as you might imagine, sensitive, well-educated in music, who was once required to listen to the first vision sung to the tune of Tumbling Tumbleweeds. Now, I know most of you don't know that tune, but those of you do are having a good laugh at the moment. Um, and finally, uh, to honor the memory of my dear friend, Eloise Bell, I remember her saying to me once, in frustration that the next time she heard someone say from the pulpit, well, I'm not a poet, 
but I just wrote a few lines here I'd like to share. She said, I'm going to stand up and say, I'm not a musician, but I have a little tune here I want to play. Now, I do assign my class to attend a Mormon meeting because you cannot understand a religion if you don't know how it worships. But I try to prepare them for what they're about to experience. And, and I tell them that, um, I explain, of course, that nothing is, there's no paid uh, person out there, not a musician, not anything, and, and that no one is trained for the ministry in our speak. Um, and, and that they were going to see a different kind of service. Um, and I hope this won't offend you, as we say, this is, this is going to be quite amateurish. But I don't want you to stop there. This is my religious studies training to them. It doesn't stop with your noticing the chaos. You must ask how this chaos serves this particular religious movement. What do they get out of that? How does it work for them? What do they accomplish? How does it fit with their larger belief system? Okay? And so if this were a class, I would give you a chance to offer your thoughts about that. It's a good question, no? So this is what I tell them after we discuss it. Now, from my point of view, that what this tells us is this is a religious system that values growth over any other principle having to do with order or experience. It's a highly professional group, usually. And yet, that, they're not seeking that level of accomplishment that they have in their workaday world. And in fact, the joke is that when you achieve a level of competence in what you're doing, you, you get released. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And then there's a second thing that this accomplishes for the Larry Saint congregation. It schools everybody else in charity. Everyone knows how they are supposed to receive that offering. But yes, I was the investigator class, and I waited a couple of weeks, and I went up to this fellow, and I talked about how Joseph Smith got the Book of Mormon. So these things work out in relationship in Mormonism. So anyway, that's just one little insight uh, with, with a sense of how religious studies doesn't judge, but seeks to understand, assumes that there are premises at work that make what religious people doing do rational, even if they look irrational to the outsider. And it's that reasoning, it's those premises that we're trying to understand. But yes, I would say to my colleague on the other side of the aisle, practicing Mormons have other ways of understanding what they do when they are doing their religion. That is exactly what we, in the secular study of religion, are trying to understand when we put them under our microscope which we no doubt do with greater or lesser accuracy in any given case. I would even go so far as to agree with him and the implicit concern that our studies can be dangerous to those who think words of worldly wisdom will assure them that their faith is true. They will be at best disappointed. At worst, such misplaced expectation can turn into an opposite and equal critical naivete that endangers what faith they have. Nevertheless, the fact that those kinds of people are out there should not keep those who can appreciate the respective virtues of faith and reason, should not keep them from studying religion, and should not keep them from receiving the benefit from religious studies. So without fussing any further about these tensions between religious education and religious studies, let me now share with you how I have come indirectly to understand my own religion better through directly comparing it to others, situating it in its cultural and historical context, and using the methods and theories of the academy. I will begin by focusing my comments, well in fact throughout, I'm going to focus my comments on the question of how power functions in Mormonism. And, uh, First, a fairly simple example, and then a more complex one. So, any comparison of Mormonism to other religions shows that it has a particular view of the religious significance of power. You could even say that Mormonism's preoccupation with theologizing on and self-conscious institutionalization of power is one of its defining characteristics. 
Joseph Smith says as much in the canonized portion of his history. Looking back on his first vision, he concludes that he was waved off of joining any church because they all had a form of godliness without the power thereof. Again, for religious studies, as opposed to religious edu education, the question here is not whether Smith or Mormonism, or Mormonism succeeded at obtaining that power. That's not what we ask. They would, that would be a truth question. Even the same question Smith asked that sent him into the grove. We tend to hit our books. So, what we would want to know is, how is this power of godliness conceptualized? How is, it, how is the receipt of it enabled and experienced? What purposes does it serve? Who wields it? For the disinterested, disinterested observer, one of the more interesting questions is, given that the record shows that Smith, like Moses, wanted all God's people to be prophets, how did early Mormonism not fracture into a thousand prophet-led movements? Cutting to the chase and applying ritual studies theory to this question, let me say that Smith structured power within three parallel sites of authority priestly office, priestly council, and priestly kinship. And ultimately, over a 14-year period, he defined their power chiefly by allusion to biblical narratives featuring Aaron, Melchizedek, and Abraham. But first, let's look at the ritually constructed sites of authority and then use, and the use of narrative function to inhabit those sites. So, let me give you an example. The American cultural context can tempt us to see Mormon power structures as pattern on American constitutionalism or a kind of separation of powers. Executive, legislative, judicial, and with individuals limited to a role in one or the other of those kinds of power. But this is not the case. Rather, all believers held degrees of authority in all sites simultaneously as officers of, officers of the church, members of councils, and kin within sacramentalized families. Because all contemporaneously held positions in each site, in office, council, and kinship, their status was necessarily a function of where they stood at any given moment. <coughs> a practical effect of this arrangement was to ensure that no individual had ultimate authority in every circumstance including Smith himself, who was subject to trial by the High Council. This stabilized Mormonism's potentially self-destructive lawlessness, in other words, every person being a law unto themselves, antinomianism is the big word, um, this stabilized the church. And while this seems complicated, as practitioners, your experience of it is quite, you should make this quite obvious to you. You know this story? The President Church came to your house on Monday night, or wherever it is, Whenever it is, you have family all the evening. Who calls on someone's prayer? It's not the president of the church. His status shifts as he moves into a different site of priesthood, in this case, the familial site, what I'm calling kinship priesthood. So this way of expressing and controlling power has by now been so naturalized within Mormonism that it seldom, if ever, rises to consciousness. And you might say that's not a problem, and I would agree with you, particularly in terms of ritual. But I think it is a problem if we don't appreciate Joseph Smith's genius in this regard. And, and it takes a lot for me to say this, but I have come to believe that his genius in organizational matters is equal to his genius in scriptural matters. And that's no small thing. So we naturalize it. I think it's good we take these things for granted and move in this kind of natural, learned, natural natural way of being things, but don't miss the particular genius at work in how Mormonism is organized. So, but let's look at an earlier example of the phenomenon of this shifting power, namely the occasion of Smith's organizing the first High Council. As you might expect, the minutes of the meeting describe rituals of ordination, each member receiving new authority by laying on of hands by one with superior authority, namely Smith himself. And again, as you might expect, attention then shifting to instru instructing the council in its duties and 
the parliamentary procedures as well as religious virtues that were to govern its conduct. At the end of which, the meeting took a surprising turn, however. Smith called his father from among the ranks of the council for a blessing upon his brother Samuel and himself. These blessings were performed in the same fashion as Smith had blessed them and made them members of the high council. The substance of the father's blessing was to pronounce additional powers on his son, or to promise additional powers to his sons. Joseph, the father said to the president of the church, I lay my hands upon thy head and pronounce the blessings of thy progenitors upon thee and that thou mayest hold the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven until the coming of the Lord. Amen. In the same fashion to his other son, the father said, Samuel, I lay my hands upon thy head and pronounce the blessings of thy progenitors upon thee, that thou mayest remain a priest of the Most High God, and like Samuel of old, hear his voice saying, Samuel, Samuel, end of quote. In this final stage of the ritual creation of the High Council, Joseph Smith placed himself on equal footing with his brother, and in subordinate relationship to his father, within minutes of having exercised his presiding authority over them. Books. This status reversal was also enacted by the only other father and son present. John Johnson was invited to bless his son Luke, who had been called to the High Council by President Smith. Now the record does not state Smith's purpose in including these patriarchal blessings in the rites that conferred ecclesiastical authority. The effect was to place in high relief and legitimize <coughs> the existence of shifting power relationships among these new leaders and those they led. Smith's reversing his own status and treating it as one with that of his brother Samuel and Luke Johnson demonstrated the High Council that their power was not absolute. It varied and was limited according to their relation to others. The assertion of familial authority reminded each hierarchy that he was always somebody's son and subordinated to him regardless of his ecclesiastical authority. The right even mitigated the supremacy of those in the first presidency, showing them subordinate in some things to other authority, even though, as sons, they were superordinate, they were above their fathers. Time permitting, these same elements could be described in the organization of the Relief Society. As in all other priestly councils, the Relief Society's power was created by ordination rites and allusions to familial relations. Also, its power was exercised within an ecclesiastical bureaucracy of offices and councils, wherein individuals were both granted authority and limited vis-a-vis -vis others in the exercise of it. With the introduction of the women into the church's power structure, these limitations included gender distinctions from the beginning. These distinctions were defined not in terms of the nature of the power given, but its jurisdictional scope. But rather, ra but rather than continue this line of inquiry, I would like to use the appearance of kinship in the record of priesthood power development to illuminate how other aspects of how power functions in Mormonism to both enable and restrain human exercise of the power of godliness, and to restrain it in a way that helps us understand what the nature of power is as godliness. So, now at this point, I'm going to ask you to follow along with a few images and a few quotations that can fill in, I hope, with some analysis or my reading to you. Uh, what I want to do is, as I said, examine what is this power of godliness that's invested in kinship. My answer is going to, to be given to you in three, in three pieces. I started to write this, but it just kept getting more and more complicated. And I had too much pity for you. So, the first piece is, Smith defined this power through narrative function, through stories. If you're looking for a definition of most of what Smith as what Smith does, Joseph Smith does, you will, you will find it in his stories, his scriptures, and he does that with his power of godliness. Um, secondly, this power works in relationships, as we've seen, but I'm going to talk about another relationship here in particular. And it's bestowed, this priesthood, this power is bestowed by stealing rites. Now, as I say that, you'll say, well, of course, in some respects. But what I want you to watch for 
is we're going to be looking at Abrahamic covenant, cosmos, and Abrahamic marriage using ritual studies methods and approaches that help us see things that we wouldn't otherwise see. For example, the introduction of patriarchal blessings to the organizational meeting of the First High Council. So we're going to be looking for things like that. Um, and we're going to be doing it with theories of narrative function. What is it narratives do? Just briefly, uh, one of the things they do is they give human beings a sense of what is real. You live in stories. That's why you can forget yourself in stories. And if you will give yourself up to stories, what you're doing is you're, you're understanding your past in light of a future possibility in order to know where you are in the present and to reach that future. So human time, this sense of human time that's created out of the past, the present, and the future gets negotiated, gets imagined, and then affected in real time through narratives. And there are different kinds of narratives, obviously. There's a narrative you read once, and you put, and you're done with it. There's a narrative that you read for as much time as you can give it, if only 10 minutes a day. Those narratives will never fail to occupy your, your religious imagination. So Smith does it through his narratives. He, he, he establishes um, uh, these, these relationships. Uh, well, OK. Narrative function and ritual, keep your eye on that. I'll bring up the other theories as we go through. But this is where we're going to go. Notice, notice this picture, if you will. Um, this is, of course, uh, uh, a medieval a representation of Abraham. Uh, notice, uh, for those of you who, who uh, don't know your iconography, think of Elvis Presley, Rock Me in the Bosom of, Ab Rock me in the bosom of Abraham. This is a reference to Abraham's salvific capacity. Right? So, let's begin. Joseph introduces us to Abraham as someone who is in trouble. He is a fatherless son. It's kind of interesting to think about how many in that first generation were fatherless sons and how they grappled with this problem in relation to priesthood. But Abraham is the model of that. He is a fatherless son. His father is a pagan. So he's seeking for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same. He's looking for two things. He wants the blessings, but he also wants to administer those blessings. And to possess greater knowledge and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. This occurs, as you can see, within two verses of the text. This is what the book of Abraham is about. So the next time you're tempted to pull a verse out of context and use it to, on Mother's Day or something, so you could probably use this on Mother's Day, um, read these scriptures in context. So this is what, what Abraham is looking for. And he says, and I found it. What did I find? Well, in the King James Version, you get this. That he'd be exceedingly fruitful, that he'll make nations of thee, and, uh, and God, I will make an everlasting covenant with him, and that God would be the God of his people. This is what the Hebrew Bible, or at least the Christian version of the Hebrew Bible, tells us about Abraham's covenant. And then Joseph Smith does this to it. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee above all measure, and make, a, make thy name great upon all nations, among all nations, and thou shalt be a blessing to thy seed after thee. And what is the blessing? Well, they will bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations. And that sounds like missionary work. And I will bless them through thy name, for as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name, and shall be accounted thy seed, and shall rise up and bless thee as their father. This fits very nicely in the New Testament concern for adoption. And Joe Smith will pick up this idea of adoption as well, but he will use it very differently. In other words, the book of Abraham portrays three moments in the divine in intervention in Abraham's life that comport with the broad strokes of the biblical account. But it makes of those strokes a very different picture. It begins with Abraham as a seeker after the blessings of his prophet, patriarch fathers, it climaxes with his obtaining the blessings of land, priesthood, and progeny that informs Israel's self-understanding. 
And then it concludes with a moment of instruction into divine cosmology that gives divine cosmology where things come from, what is real, how the universe is organized. This is where we hear our answers to where do we come from, why are we here, where are we going. Right? That's what cosmology is. That gives purpose to the previous two events. Now, time is insufficient to delve into this narrative in the detail it deserves, or that you would need to to appreciate the religious tour de force it constitutes as an attempt to define the universe and give three reasons why. I will only be able to discuss the final turning point in the narrative and its relation to Smith's conception of humanity's divine potential, manifest in its capacity to engender holiness. So, there's two things going on what I just said. You have to bring in Moses, the Moses text here. In, in Moses 1, Joseph Smith upends almost 2,000 years of what we call theological anthropology. In that verse that we do often take out of context, where Moses has seen the world and the worlds that God has made, and God says, do you have any questions? And Moses says, oh yeah, why? Now I want you to pause for a moment and think about anybody else who'd allow themselves to be backed into that corner to try to answer that question. Moses sees the universe, and he says, why? Why the universe? And God says, well, that's for me to know and you to find out, but this much I can tell you. <laughs> this is my work. This is what I do. And my glory, it's who I am, to make you like me. To bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Immortality and eternal life is God's name. That's God's name. And so, this is my godness. This is what makes me God. Is that I have the capacity to engender in you the quality of life which I possess. That's why I'm God. Now, again, if this were a religious studies class, we would proceed to, to look at all other, not all, as many as we could, ways people understand who God is. And so when I, tend, when I talk to people in the Reformed tradition, Presbyterians, I, I, say, I acknowledge that one of the great things that divide us is that Mormons believe that they can become like God. And they say, yeah, yeah, that's really, that's really hard for us because for them, it's all about sovereignty, right? We could talk about why that is. I said, but before you can have a meeting of the minds about that conversation, is you have to know who Mormons think God is. And they think God is Father. And they take that literally. And so when they say they believe in becoming like God, they mean they believe that they are called and capacitated by grace to engender the quality of spiritual life that they possess in others. That's what Mormons think they're doing. Now, it gets more complicated, of course, but ultimately they believe when they say they will achieve this thing of Godness, it is this greater capacity to engender eternal life, God's life, in others. And that's what, and that's what Latter-day Saints believe they were created for, right? That's what eternal progression is all about. So when you get to this verse, in thee, that is in thy priesthood, and in thy seed, that is thy priesthood. Surely you've been troubled by this verse. <laughs> Uh, for I give unto thee a promise that this right shall continue in thee. These, these rights of the fathers, these rights to priesthood, this right to what we call patriarchal priesthood, shall continue in thee and in thy seed after thee. That is to say, the literal seed or the seed of the body shall all the families of the earth be blessed, even with the gospel, which is defined as my name, life eternal. Right. So. I give you this promise, this right shall continue in thee. So, Abraham's patriarchal capacity is both of his body and adopted. Right. Through Abraham, people will receive entry into that gate that is not just salvation, but the means of exaltation. And it is this capacity that reconstitutes Abraham I'm sorry, Abram, as Abraham, his name changes. He is now something different. So this is, this, in this narrative, you have the roots of, of, 
of a kind of priesthood that Joe Smith only talks about um, in the last couple of years of his life. Uh, he was pretty busy in Kirtland, in Missouri. <laughs> but when he gets a moment, and also under the pressure of his expectation of his imminent demise, he starts rolling out these higher doctrines. And he starts talking about the patriarchal priesthood. And you can see that Abraham is, is his model for Abrahamic priesthood. What I want to suggest to you that that patriarchal is a bit of a misdirection. It's not wrong by any means, but because of the way we define that word, it can be a misdirection for us. None of this was possible without Sarai, and I don't mean this as an issue of justice. I don't mean this as a matter of equality in politics. It's very hard for us to have this conversation and not have it be political immediately. But None of this was possible without Sarai, or we should say now, as evidence of the fact that she was engaged in this, is that her name is changed as well to Sarah, a mother of nations. Not just having physical fertility, but, in some, but having some sense of dominion and right, even a capacity to bestow priestly rights on her progeny in virtue of their birth out of her. Here, too, the text adds specificity, but in a manner that adds force to the covenant's biological dimension uh, or priestly birthright. And that's what you get in here is this, that makes this verse a little uncomfortable for us. This, this notion of priestly right that we abstract so thoroughly is, so, is embedded completely in Abraham's body. Um, so, uh, so, let me pick up here. So without her, these grand promises were unrealizable. The new Abraham is not without the new Sarah, or for that matter, Hagar and Keturah, in achieving his, quote, sought for blessings of the fathers and, the, and to become a father of many nations and a prince of peace. What he learned was that none of these gifts were possible outside of marriage, we would say, to use a contemporary social term. Ultimately, Smith's modern textual contribution to the Abraham mythos, and mythos is a, is a word we use because we're trying, we would like to use the word myth, but everybody thinks of Walt Disney when you use the word myth. And they think you're talking about fantasy as opposed to these grand narratives that explain the relationship of humanity to the divine. That's what mythos means um, to us in religious studies. So Smith's modern textual contribution to the Abraham mythos was to overtly link the great patriarch's spiritual and literal fatherly capacities to his status as a husband, in contrast to a long Christian history that deemed marriage a defense against carnality, or at best, a temporal good for the social order. That's, I'm saying a lot in those two phrases. That Christianity had deemed but very early, very, very early, had deemed marriage a defense against carnality, or at best, a temporal good for social order, that Smith invested in marriage a mutually held reciprocity of priestly power exemplified in the biblical Abraham. In 1835, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, he's, that's the year he organized the, the High Council. It's certainly the year he begins to, um, I think, Anyway, I shouldn't guess. I'm terrible with the dates. I'm a historian. I'm terrible with dates. But of course, you have jo Joseph Senior being called as a patri patriarch in, in that time, too. I should ask Sam. He would know. Um, and eight, so in 1835, I do know, however, that Smith began to redact the Abraham saga. The church's newspaper editorialized, we may, pre we may prepare ourselves for a kingdom of glory where the man is neither without the woman nor the woman without the man in the Lord. For Smith, Abraham and Sarah's marital priesthood was the means by which the glory of the divine nature was to be inculcated in the parties and their progeny, and thus all the families of the earth blessed with the blessings of life eternal. In 1842, the year he published the Book of Abraham, Smith began to implement the practice of plural marriage, initiating men into the first temple rites and organizing women in an ecclesiastical council directed by a revelatory presidency and given salvific and ecclesiastical status, as we've seen. All of this activity was an expression of Smith's investment of sanctifying power in the Nauvoo Temple's new rite of marital sealing, which made overt the implicit, the implicit gendered reciprocity of Abrahamic priesthood. I've written about this elsewhere, and it's its own story, but it must suffice today to summarize the significance of the rite using its earliest 
extant language, dating to a few months after the publication of the Book of Abraham. And I think if I did this correctly. Oh, no. Gotta go back. Sorry. Abraham and the Cosmos. I can do this quickly, too. There's a section of the Book of Abraham that we always jump over. And we're a little embarrassed by it because um, the world makes fun of us over it. Can you think of what it is? It becomes after, it comes after he, um, we have the language about what is the Abrahamic covenant, and before the section, or the part where we always begin, now if there are two intelligences, do you know what comes between that? This, this comes between that. Abraham is shown the heavens, and in the course of that, um, God shows him how this power is to operate. Remember my first question was, what is the definition of this power? It is the power of godliness, the power to engender life. Um, how does this power operate is the second question. Well, Orson Hyde heard Joseph Smith talk about how this power, and he thought it operated like this. Wherever the other lines meet, he says in his notes, there sits a king and a priest unto God, bearing rule, authority, and dominion under the Father. So I want you to look at this chart. Notice its attributes. Obviously, uh, Orson Hyde imagines that there would be any number of lines proceeding from any one line. Right? And then I want you to compare it to what Abraham saw. And what is the difference between those two images? What do you see in this picture that you don't see in the other? I will take hands on this. What, what do you see that's different? in these two representations of, oh, Abraham, this is, what, this is what this power means. This is how you're supposed to use it. This is how it operates. Yes, Christine? That one's not linear. It's not linear. And uh, it's not linear, and, and you really don't have a sense of beginning or end, right? Which comports with what else we know about existence, right? It's not linear. It's not linear. Okay. Any growth going on here? Any growth going on here? You just get more and more people underneath you. That's all you get here. <laughs> That's how this power operates. That's, uh, this, there's motion, right? There's motion, there's mass, right? There's gravity. The control that's exercised in the system is gravitational pull. Right? Think about all these ways families are supposed to love each other. Think about the promises you've received about how you will always, in some fashion, these are my, my characterization of Orson Hyde with this comment, you will always, in some fashion, be in salvific relationship to your children. Notice how this allows various relationships, again, based on gravity, to other objects in motion. And so when, so God, like to Moses, you know, Moses sees all, all of whatever he's seeing, and I, and I wonder if it wasn't at the same point that's going on with Abraham, when, and he sees all this, and Moses says, why? Well, Abraham would have had the same feeling, I imagine. And as I read that blessing to him, what does that look like, that in my seed, there's my, what, and that this is related to eternal life, and this, and this is how I not only receive the rights of the fathers, but the right to administer these rights to eternal life. What does that mean? What does it look like? And God says, it looks like this. And so that's when you get all these strange words about kolab and shinha and all of that, and given to you in, in terms of spheres of influence. Spheres of influence, gravitational pull and influence. Um, this, is, this is worth thinking about. And religious studies helps me see this, and it helps me think about ways of thinking about it. Because there's no end to where these kinds of images and this kind of scriptural language and the narrative power of these stories can take you. There's no end to where that can take you. So now, Abrahamic marriage. I'm going to stop in five minutes, and uh, uh, so I will indeed do this quickly. Because I really want to hear what you're thinking. I'd love to answer your questions. Of course, I've done, I, I have applied my religious studies to other kinds of questions, but these are the ones I thought 
you might find most thought-provoking. So here we go. Behind this bold type is a document that I think is as precious as any we have, but I don't know the entire archive. Others here in the audience do, and they might challenge me, but this is uh, the notes that Newell K. Whitney uh, made of the instructions he received from Joseph Smith in order to seal his daughter Sarah to Joseph in the spring of uh, 42, uh, early summer of 42. And Whitney reads this language, I assume reads it since it's written, and um, he says, he performs this marriage, and I know Whitney was a bishop of the church, but he doesn't perform the marriage in the name of his ecclesiastical title. You can see the names he uses. In my own name, and in the name of my wife, your mother, and in the name of my holy progenitors. Doesn't this put you back to Abraham? So in the name, according to the rights of, by the right of birth, which is priesthood, vested in me. That word vested is very useful. The lawyers here are kind of perking up. You can have rights, you know this from all your financial dealings, you can have rights or interests that don't come to your possession until later, but you nonetheless have the right to them. Think about that when we speak of children being born under the covenant. What is the covenant? It's the covenant of priesthood, of course. But, so, so Newell K. Whitney is saying, by the right of birth, which is a priesthood vested in me, he's giving his credentials here, by revelation and commandment and promise of the living God, ordained by the holy Melchizedek, Jethro, and other of the holy fathers. Jethro? What's Jethro doing in there? Right? Who was Jethro? Moses' father-in-law. Thank you, George. <laughs> Moses' father-in-law, and he was also the high, the high priest of Midian. And who was Moses? A fatherless son, as to the rights of the fathers and the right were to be ordained to himself. So, this is this, so obtained by the Holy Melchizedek, Jethro, and other of the Holy Fathers. This is a priestly event that, for lack of a better word, we call a marriage, right? This is a priestly event. And um, we could go and talk about more of the language, but this is the language I want to emphasize. You've seen the authority that is performing this union, that is creating this union, and what you see here is that same authority is what the couple receives from the union. The power that created the union is endowed, though that's a loaded term I know, is given to the couple being created in that union. So. After the exchange of, yes, I will be in companionship with you, essentially, it's, it's fascinating to compare how few, how no rights and duties vis-a-vis -vis each other, aside from the willingness to be companions, is in this ceiling right, and in the one we use even today, I dare say. So, also, now that you have covenant with each other, then, Whitney says, I command in the name of the Lord that all those priestly powers concentrate in you and through you to your posterity. Those powers I refer, refer to, referred to a moment ago in this, in this ceremony where I invoked my, invoked my own credentials. I command that those powers concentrate in you and through you to your posterity forever. All these things I do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through this order, well now there's an interesting word, that through this order, that through this order, he may be glorified. Through this order of the priesthood, through this order of the patriarchal or Abrahamic priesthood, Jesus Christ may be glorified. Let immortality and eternal life henceforth be sealed upon your heads forever and ever. Um, compare that to any other wedding you've ever been to in terms of the blessing on the couple. Let immortality and eternal life, let God's name henceforth be sealed upon your heads forever and ever. This is, sealings are not, sealings are, are referred to in the scriptures, Smith does not make up this term, but as, as is so um, interesting in him, he, he, he takes these terms that are familiar and he infuses them with particular um, uh, a, a extraordinary capacity to in, in, increase their um, their uh, ability to uh, 
to trigger our imagination. And I do believe it is through our, our religious imagination um, that we reach the Lord. I don't know how else we could otherwise. But except by obeying in those other things. But I'm saying we should add religious imagination to that. So let immortality and eternal life henceforth be sealed. So you are sealed up to each other. I mean, you are sealed up to God. Your, your salvation is assured. And you are sealed. You are joined together. But what, what I can't resist doing in, in closing is to show you this from a database I'm making at the University of Virginia on the first generation of plural marriages, marriages between 1852 and 42. And each of those circles, contrary to most, contrary to most charts, those of you who are data folks, the, 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 uh, the, the nodes are marriages, and the lines, what are the lines? Are, are people's names. And what you see are people being gathered into certain marriageable groups, or certain married groups. And you can see, is there a, is there a little thingy on this? A little laser on this? Wait, uh, I think this is it, yes. Yes, so you can see that, it's hard because of the light here, that there are different colors. Some, some of these ceilings, plural marriage ceilings, are small, but then some of them have gravitated themselves other links, that these, these families are all flowing into one another at some level. It, uh, so far, my data doesn't show what some people postulate, that all of these are sealed to Joe Smith, and I confess I'm, I'm surprised too. Um, and, but, and we'll keep looking and see what happened. As we know, this was a very disruptive period. The other two large circles you see are uh, Brigham Young and Hebrew C. Kimball, and I believe this is Newell Pig Whitney. But you can see how these lines are all flowing together, and I'd like you to remember that picture from the Hubble telescope. Right? How, and that's where actually my, my, my doctor student came in with these charts that he designed. And, and he's not LDS and, and with other specialists in, in uh, digital humanities databases, we're talking about it, but I'm just kind of going, <laughs> like, oh, this is, this is the book of Abraham. This is the, and it was amazing uh, to see this. But anyway, I thought you'd want to see that, and I'm pretty excited about it myself. So. So, as one or shall pass away in the heavens thereof, even so shall another come. Think of that Hubble telescope picture. And there is no end to my works, neither to my words. For behold, this is my glory. This is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality of eternal man. Um, I, I, uh, I think that's a lot different than this. And this is fine, right? It's not to criticize this. But if you stay here, if, 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 I don't think I can back up on this. If you stay here, you, you, you miss this. And, and I do believe this is how Joseph Smith thought. Um, and, and I think how he wants us to think about it. So, the story and hence more opportunities for religious studies analysis continues. And not least, these ideals would be available for analysis through their breach or in less value-laden terms, the inherent tension between the ever-shifting status relationships situationally defined by office, counsel, and kinship. This must be sufficient for now to make the simpler point that the scholarship, with its comparative approach, disinterest in truth claims, and attention to religious function can teach disciples whose focus is on faith. I I am grateful for Elder Maxwell's calling to our attention the beauty of the scholar-disciple and its integrity in a life of faith. I've made a, a lesser argument here tonight that disciples can also benefit from reading the words of wisdom of scholars, just scholars, um, and using the critical faculties of the scholar-disciple to choose the best books. So, let me repeat, religious studies is not the means by which you can know which church to join or how to convince somebody else to join your church, but it does have considerable wisdom about religion itself and, the specific, ki and specific kinds of religion. Not unlike a doctor in relation to bodily function, a lawyer in relation to public order, or a musical theorist in, to the, in relation to the songs you sing, 
Scholarship on religion is worth the disciples' attention, particularly those who have not faith. And that's what DNC 88 is talking about in these lines. As all have not faith. I'd like that to balance our concern that scholarship weakens faith. Here, I believe part of what this revelation is saying, and it is one of the greatest revelations in the church for all it does say, particularly about the temple, uh, what this scholarship is saying is that as all have not faith, seek ye words of wisdom out of the best book. So, for it is in that context the church is commanded to study. So let the final word be given to section 88, the olive leaf plucked from the tree of paradise, the Lord's message to peace, message of peace to us, the field of tensions of modern life, even in the signs of times. I hope this has been helpful to you in managing those tensions. And now I would really like to hear if you have any questions. It's late if some of you need to go. We've got a bit of a late start. I won't be offended at all if you need to, to walk out and uh, get a babysitter, some relief or something. Please do. But I can take questions. And someone has a mic. Oh, those lights are bright. I wasn't frowning at you. Um, oh, yes. Up in the very high seats. You showed us that chart about linear, linear priesthood, and then you showed us this. I've read about one eternal round, and I have no idea what that means. But I'm trying to explain to a non LDS friend of mine that we don't believe there's a beginning. I, I, and I don't know how to deal with, how, how have you dealt with beginnings and ends? Well, I, I just recognize I can't because I live in time. And that's not a, um, that's not a um, un, unthought answer. I, I think that, um, that, yes, one eternal round is a reference to timelessness. And I believe we are incapable of imagining timelessness. It's just one of those things. That Sam, are you going to give up the scientist's answer that? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. I'm, I'm going to. Well, Sam has a question. Since I've used his name twice, let everybody see his face. Oh, just a, a compliment and a question. Marvelous and wise and priestly as always. I think phenomenal presentation. And a question. Uh, playing in the adoption theology sources, every once in a while somebody will talk about a birthright. And they'll talk about that birthright in some kind of funky way that I've never been able to fully triangulate. It, 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 so A, have you seen that, I, I saw in the, the marriage this brief mention of birthright. So A, have you seen other mentions of birthright as some specific entity? And if you have, how does it fit into the broader sense of this priestly adoption this, experience? This may be, uh, the, as a lawyer, I, I hardly understand the question because, <laughs> am I right? Looking at the lawyers here, uh, because to me it means simply that just as a function of having been born, you have a right to the priesthood, and and I, I that seems to be uh, again pretty obvious from the Old Testament self references in you know Exodus and then what Paul is struggling with how to make the connection. He's got a, you know, Paul's got a, a bunch of fatherless sons and motherless daughters that he's converting in, among the Gentile nations, so he's trying to figure out how to get them hooked up to that. Um, and so he, but he's speaking those same terms, because what they want are the rights of their progenitors. I'll use that gender neutral term that, that was used in the, the Whitney Smith ceiling. They, they want the rights of the progenitors, but they also want the right or unto they can administer those rights, meaning that their children will have them as a matter of birth. They get them one way, the way Moses got them from the uh, priest of Midian, um, although we would say Moses didn't know who he was. He had it by birth, but he didn't know he had it, and so he might as well not have had it. But, um, so I, think, I don't think it's any more complicated than that. It's just like certain state laws give you rights of inheritance from your parents that are, are property or other kinds of financial inheritance. God gives you an inheritance 
from your parents who stand in what we're going to have of these rights to be ordered in priesthood. I think the problem comes then if you're trying to thingify priesthood. Right? If you try to thingify priesthood, you try to make it something you that you you hold as opposed to it holds you. Because your order, right? This order, that word that pops up throughout the DNC. This order that holds you, like a dinner table, let me just gender this this analogy. You got plates, you got cups, you got knives and forks. Everybody's got all kinds of offices. But everybody's on the table that's priesthood. And so Joseph F. Smith, when the when the seventies and the high priests are fighting over who's greater in the early 20th century. Um, and Joseph F. Smith is trying to calm him down. He says, you know, your, your, uh, your priesthood is the same, your authority is the same, your callings lie in different directions. Right? And I think, I think, so that birthright puts you <coughs> you're on the table when you're born, if you've been born under the covenant. Hi, Professor Flake. Um, so I'm I'm a master's in religious. I'm getting my master's in religious studies here at BYU, and I'm also uh, a convert to the church. Um, I was I was born a Hindu, and I have found that uh, just in my experience, whether through religious department or at church, that uh, sometimes, um, and you alluded to this a bit, um, members are often hesitant toward the principle of holy envy, or just learning more truths, whether it be about our faith through comparison of other uh, religions. And I, I, I'm just curious, um, through your experience, what's been the best way of going about that and helping people to understand that, um, you know, there, there are some good um, in other places and, and uh, best books aren't necessarily here, are all here. I, I think most people are um, afraid that you're going to take something from them if, if you look disinterestedly at religion. But, and that somehow you're going to take something from them. And so I think if they trust that you're going to give them something, then they'll relax a little bit. But that's my experience in any Sunday school lesson, truthfully, or any kind of teaching. Um, you, but you have to obtain their trust, and their trust is going to depend upon what they value, and you find that common value. So if it's that kind of emotional question, but, but I also want to be respectful that there are, there are complicated questions out there about religion and how it's lived. I personally um, not only uh, feel uh, unthreatened by, but um, have uh, found uh, even joy in knowing how much religion is a human product, because it fits with what I understand LDS theology to be, not, not least what it says in the scripture, the, the kingdom is yours until I come. That's a perfect thought, but, but um, God does involve us in his work as a way of changing us. And, he, and that change requires that we be involved to a great extent. But when it's all said and done, he says, you'll know that I did it, right? So uh, I trust both those things are going on. That jo in Joseph Smith's case, for example, that much was left to his working it out. I think, I think he got very good at throwing spaghetti against the wall. And I'm shocked at how much of it stuck <laughs> as, as he tried to, to take these experiences and codify them and create a system by which others could replicate his experience, right? He experienced the divine. He tried to work, he, he articulated it in some, but he also articulated it in such a fashion with these rituals and these narratives and these organizational structures whereby other people 200 years later, almost 200 years later, could replicate that experience. I mean, that's, that's an extraordinary accomplishment. To me that, anyway, so I don't, I don't believe that any more than I, I believe that God whispered into Joseph Smith's ear the equivalent of the you know, translation of the Mormon. I think Joseph was very much, I think his fingerprints are all over this work, and I like that. 
It, it gives me, it, it excites me for what's possible for me in my relationship to God. First of all, thank you very much. The, 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 the premise of my question may be wrong, so let me, let me, so we don't need to get to it, but let me tell you the premise. The premise of my question is that uh, I take it that you have been evangelizing for a, a, a point of view uh, for Latter-day Saints, that's this audience is in particular, that we ought to, um, that we ought to allow uh, the academic, the, the, the lessons that can be learned from academic uh, ways of thinking about religion to help us understand uh, our religion. And, and if that is your premise, I agree with it entirely. Is that, but, but let me start there. Is that the premise? Is this, you're, you're, you're trying to encourage us to think of, uh, of, of religion in ways that perhaps, or that, that, that come from the rigorous training of the academy? Well, if you're people who would come to an event like this, then yes, I would encourage you to. I'm, I, I'm always talking to that and don't try this at home. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so my, my question is, if you're, if you're evangelizing, and I hope you are, why do you think it is that, uh, that this mode of thinking has not been more common in, in the Mormon tradition? It, it, given the, the nature of the revelations and what they say. I, I think two things about it. This mode of thinking, um, is, uh, appeals to a certain kind of person, right? And so, I, I don't, I don't think it necessary. I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's useful to everybody. I don't think everybody wants it, much less needs it. I, th I think the ways of faith have their own epistemology, have their own way of no, of learning knowledge, right? I think the reason Mormonism doesn't lead with the analytical way of thinking about religion because it's a revelatory tradition. And, and the way to receiving revelation is a different process. Alma, willingly suspend your disbelief and experiment upon my words. So do it. Learn it by doing it. People like you and me learn it by reading a book. But religion is something you have to do. You can't just read about it and know what it is. It's not that you have to do it. Let me backtrack here quickly. Um, I study a lot of religions. I'm not going to do what those religions do, but I'm going to watch the people that do them. I'm not just going to read their texts. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to try to use all I can to understand them. But I'm not trying to learn if that religion, that Hindu, whether Hinduism is, is the only true tradition, right? If, if that's the question you've got, then I don't think scholarship, I said very clearly, I don't think scholarship is how you go about that. It always worries me when I find young people. And I knew I was old when I got to Chicago and I, there was a student there who came in the normal course of life, as opposed to I would come back after another career. And I could tell he was there because he wanted to know if Mormonism was true. And I just thought, boy, that's just such a bad idea. And sure enough, he didn't last very long, either in the program or in the church, I don't think. So I don't think it's the church's business to adopt this way of thinking or the product of this thought. I'm sorry, I'm taking too long to answer this question. Um, but for people like you, Come on in, the water's fine, is what I'm saying. But I'm not saying everybody should be a swimmer. So one more, and then you all get to go so have some. Any women that wanted to ask? <laughs> yes, any women. <laughs> any women. I, Kate, but I'd even take another woman if there was another woman out there. I was hesitating, Kathleen, because this isn't a question, it's an observation, so okay, you can react to make me back water. Man. Go ahead, Kate. But I so, <laughs> I so love this image, and I so prefer it to the Orson Hyde image, which I've seen at home. <laughs> we don't exercise it at home. But <laughs> and I was thinking, you can see in this image that there's an animating, unifying force and I'm thinking of that as priesthood. 
and I'm thinking about how there are bright moments all over held by this priesthood, and there are also lights that are barely able to be called light, and they're also held by that priesthood. And it just feels like such a beautiful vision to me of, of a gospel of forgiveness and charity and grace and, and unity. And I wanted to thank you for thank you. changing me by showing and, that image. And relationship. And relationship. Right? And so what is the, what we call it priesthood. But what's the real name of priesthood? Section 107, verse 3. It is star to say. Who's got it? Who's got it? Um, I can't hear. I can't hear. What? <laughs> the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. Order. It is an order. It's not a thing. It's a way of ordering people so they may partake of the divine nature. So, all right, well, thank you very much.